This week, Christians are asking all over again why a good God would allow people to suffer. And 15 years ago, in the summer of 2008, many debated the same topic after a little indie book hit it big. That was The Shack by William P. Young and guests, which followed a man called Mac who sought spiritual healing from fictional versions of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This both did and did not go over well with readers and critics, but what now do we think of The Shack and its deconstruction of evangelical ideas and arguably some challenges to Bible doctrine itself? Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, the podcast from lorehaven.com. We explore fantastical stories for God's glory. I'm E. Steamer Burnett, the publisher and co-author of The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell. And whenever we go on a road trip, I always like to spot these lonely buildings out in the countryside all by themselves. It's kind of where I want to retire one day, except horror movies have taught me that cabin in the woods are very dangerous. And perhaps this book will teach me that a shack is full of other dangers. And this is episode 168, 15 years ago. How did the shack deconstruct Bible doctrine? You know, I just realized I put a bias in that headline. I didn't say, did the shack deconstruct Bible doctrine? I <laughs> asked, did. how did the shack? Yes. Yeah, so really no suspenseful ending here. We're going to go out on a limb and say, yes, the shack did deconstruct some Bible doctrine. It has actually been six years since the movie version debuted in March of 2017. Maybe you saw that one. And May and June of this year actually do mark 15 years since the book released. I remember the fracas back then, Zach. I just uh, stopped working at a Christian book store i think but i was still keeping up with a lot of christian publishing and uh this one made it big and it does count as fantastical and so it has in some ways i think seeded some ideas among christian readers uh, and even has a bit of a subtle legacy i would say uh, among the genres of christian fantastical fiction yeah steven at the time i had a really good friend recommend this book to me i think it was my friend aaron and i remember one of the things that she said and that others said was The shack showed a realistic picture of suffering and dealt with the problem of pain. And I I think specifically the comment was, it's not one of those, you know, saccharine, sentimental type stories about suffering. It really, like someone really suffers in it and really wrestles through the questions. Now, I'm going to go and say my concession stand, I have not read The Shack. I'm only going off of what others have said. So, Stephen, this is going to be a fun episode because you're going to get get to tell me all about it. Just kind of an avatar for our audience members that may not have read it. So, I'm gonna ha- I have a lot of questions for you about this book. So, I did read The Shack and um, studied it fairly in depth for a couple of articles I wrote uh, at another website a few years ago. Uh, maybe I'll blend them both together and uh, re-release as a as a Lorehaven special. Stay tuned to the end of this episode because, with all due respect, Zach, I disagree with your friend. Unless they've grown up watching only Hallmark movies or G-rated Disney cartoons, I don't think The Shack presents uh, suffering in a realistic way. I think that it sentimentalizes and cleans up uh, the horror of suffering uh, in a very, I think, well-intended project uh, to try to get God off the hook for some of these things. Uh, but also to offer a lot of sentimentalist response. I mean, there's literally the shack at one point, like is literally shown turning into what can only be described as, uh, oh, here's a favorite target again. Uh, no, no shade thrown, but a Thomas Kincaid cottage. Uh, and there's deer prancing around and flower petals uh, spiraling in the air. And some of this imagery sounds like kind of an evangelical Lisa Frank artwork from your school notebook in the 90s. And visuals aside, some of the ideas I just really, I think, offer a shallow understanding of suffering and frankly, try to give the very easy answers that we say we don't want in stories. So the fact that it mm-hmm. struck people as actually working through some complex issues uh, strikes me uh, as, a, as a great surprise, but I'll have to show my work in just a bit here. I mean, I, th- I think it's like you said, maybe it's because my friends had the more G or PG rated stories before this, and that's kind of all they knew from Christian authors. And so this was a little bit of a departure from that. So yeah, I I think it kind of depends on where you've come from before reading it. Right. And you've got to start somewhere. And that's what we want to do. We want to respect readers who liked this book, or maybe even still like this book, or like books like that, or maybe would like to write a book uh, like that, uh, a book that targets uh, the idea of suffering and death and those sorts of things in in a complex way and explores those. 
In that case, so this may be an example of what not to do or an example of what to do, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, pulled up some notes here about the shack from the Wikipedia. The shack went largely unnoticed for over a year after its initial publication, but suddenly became a very popular seller in mid-2008 when it debuted at number one on the New York Times paperback fiction bestseller list on June the 8th. Its success was the result of a word-of-mouth, church-to-church, blog-to-blog campaign by Young, Jacobson, and Cummings, those were the authors, in churches and Christian-themed radio websites and blogs. So some of you professional Christians out there, church influencers, maybe you remember uh, some of this going on back there. It invited a lot of critique as well. Uh, for example, uh, back of when we were running the Speculative Faith website, our own writer Rebecca Llewellyn Miller engaged graciously with the shack, and the late uh, author and pastor Timothy Keller uh, gently critiqued the story. I'm sure it was very winsome, but also very firm as uh, Keller was known for. Uh, I remember one of my favorite articles uh, was from David Mathis, an editor at uh, Desiring God. He engaged the story on its own terms, especially themes of pain and suffering. And one of my favorite authors, Randy Alcorn, uh, challenged the theology of the book. Uh, Alcorn knows a little something about writing, about bad things happening to good people, uh, or so it seems, uh, if God is good, why do bad things happen to people? So he had a really great voice on that. We'll put all those links in the show notes, but I'm not going to spend the whole time saying, Look for that link in the show notes. Just assume it's there, uh, and I'll get to my concession stand in a moment here. First, let's talk about a book that we can wholeheartedly support. Uh, it's from our first sponsor of this episode, the segment sponsored by Enclave Publishing. It's Estuary by Lisa T. Berggren. It is book one of the new Oceans of Time series, sequel to the best-selling Rivers of Time series by the author. Enclave Publishing presents Estuary, in which history major Luciana Bettarini takes a summer job alongside her twin, Domenico as a period actor at Costello Ferrelli in Italy. As incoming college seniors, this might be their last chance to spend meaningful time together, so she's soaking up every minute. But when Nico's theory that their lost Bedarini relatives have traveled through time becomes potentially real, and they might be able to follow, Lucci fears they'll be forever divided. Estuary by Lisa T. Berggren is the sequel to the best-selling Rivers of Time series, kicking off a new Oceans of Time series, and it is now available wherever fantastic books are sold. You can order it. The link's in our show notes for episode 168, or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. It is in hardcover as well as audiobook right now. Zach, uh, that makes me hungry to think about traveling through time, whether it's 15 years ago to when the shack was taking the evangelical world and otherwise by storm uh, or traveling back in time into medieval Italy. Either way, here's our concession stand. We're going to assume in this episode that, yes, certain ideas are heresy. We'll use the H word. We don't use that word often. I don't want to use that word often because it is very serious. If you believe a heresy on purpose, that means you're not a Christian. If you believe a heresy on purpose, very important qualifier, that means that your soul is in jeopardy and you need to repent and change your belief. So don't use the H word lightly. It doesn't refer to uh, denominational distinctives or ideas about what Christians would call secondary issues. Heresy does mean ideas that directly challenge God's nature and the gospel and yet, Zach, I would point out that it's very important to specify that you're believing a heresy on purpose. I think that some people, because imaginations are weird and people are weirder, some people were, will drift into accepting a heretical idea. Somebody calls them up uh, on the phone and says, hey, uh, we're, we're with a polling firm. What do you think about this? And then somebody is really busy and they slip up and they don't get their wording right. And then suddenly they're part of the percentages that say, you know, 75% of evangelicals don't believe God is real. I don't necessarily think that that means 75% of evangelicals are going to hell. That also includes many people who loved the shack. As you'll see in this episode, we're not going to pick on those folks. This may have been your first exposure to Christian fiction or devotional fiction, arguably a sermon kind of disguised as fiction, frankly. And so you got to start somewhere. You know, maybe you never read a book before that dealt with uh, an idea of suffering at this level. Um, also lots of people critiqued the shack. I will frankly put myself among those. And yet the book was, uh, not as bad as I thought it would be when I read it. And yet it was also in other ways worse. So we're going to try not to pick on anybody here. It's just about ideas here, not personalities. And we will say that it is healthy for Christians to debate the themes and styles of fiction. That means we're taking fiction seriously. We're not going to do the whole touch, not the Lord's anointed. It made people feel good. Don't be divisive thing whether it's The Shack or The Chosen. 
We're going to do the, hey, let's unite around discussing these things in good faith as much as possible. That also means, though, we've got to meet the book on its own terms. You're not going to review the book as a, just a, a Christian thriller novel or just a sermon because it's trying to do both at the same time, and I'm not sure it works out all that great. But we're going to try to honor the purpose of the book. And by the way, we're also going to try to honor the fact that the book has not one author, but three authors, one book. Ironic, huh? Given the old Trinity theme. And yet there's only one name on the front. Why is that? We'll answer that question pretty soon. And for more about why we believe in respecting yet challenging Christian authors uh, and not trying to get them canceled, you can go to our uh, Fantastical Truth episode 96 about that. Any thoughts, uh, Zach? Yeah. You know, first of all, your point about being divisive. Yeah, it, it's not divisive at all if we are tackling and addressing and exposing false teaching, whether or not that's through a sermon or through a story. Uh, false teaching itself is divisive, especially when it brings about this attitude of, well, you can't criticize this person. Uh, that, that is the definition of divisive, because then you're kind of cordoning off a teacher and all of his followers and that doctrine as untouchable. And that's literally the definition of divisive. Uh, but at the same time, you know, a story is not entirely a sermon. And so there's fun and enjoyable parts of a story. So we're going to talk about the good and the bad in this episode. It's not going to be all just teak. And I, I appreciate some of the, uh, the articles that you've written, Stephen, you, you, you had a lot of good things to say about this book. And so I mean, yeah, there's a reason it sold millions of copies. Like I'm reading this uh, Tim Keller article from 2017 or so. You know, he said, look, it, there's a reason it sold 7.2 million copies. That was as of 2009. So just a couple of years after it came out, you know, it, it did really touch something that people uh, resonated with. And, but Keller at the same time says, quote, the shack effectively deconstructs the holiness and transcendence of God. It is simply not there and its place is unconditional love, period, <laughs> end quote. So yeah, I, I think that's a pretty big issue. I think it's definitely worth a discussion about. And, you know, this doesn't mean that uh, the book wasn't enjoyable for people who enjoyed it, but it means that because it's enjoyable, we have to take a much more careful look. Because it's the things that we enjoy and that we really love that can sneak in ideas that are harmful to us. So that's why we're going to get into this. Exactly. And even though it's 15 years ago that this book came out, I still see it float around on the bestseller lists. So even though the discourse may have cooled about it on some of the corresponding notions back then among church influencers about the so-called emerging church uh, may be done uh, anybody remember that label? Probably some nerds out there would remember, yeah, but the book is still that. having an effect. Uh, it's still an issue. And I would say, Zach, that some of the ideas, uh, particularly the whole unconditional love idea, uh, that is love is love and, you know, just self-referential philosophy like that. Some of that stuff has been seeded out into other evangelical traditions and even yeah. e other Christian made fantastical novels. So seeing them kind of distilled here in the shack can really help. Although I will say that we're going to go pretty long in this episode, I'm guessing. And even then, faithful listener, we're not going to get to all my notes. We're just yeah. not. So <laughs> we're going to throw open the uh, throw open the channels uh, for the comm station at the end. Let us know what you think about it and maybe uh, where we could spin off some other uh, other episode topics from this episode. All right. Well, let's go to chapter one. Stephen, what was the Shack book really all about? Well, I read a bad review and it said it was about, no, I actually read the book myself. So, okay. So, oh, wait, wait hold on. A concession stand is still open. Let me grab one. Okay. So if you heard something bad about the shack and you haven't read the book, uh, it's okay to repeat the thing that you heard if it ends up being true. Uh, that's kind of a policy I have because there's so many books, so little time. Uh, I did read the book just so I could speak authoritatively about it, but there was enough negative reviews that you've probably got the general idea unless the reviews are lying to you. Uh, it's okay. I think right here, let's have a mini concession stand within a concession stand that it's okay to not read a book and dismiss it entirely because Agreed. of a review you read, like yes, just in exactly. defense of book reviews. That's the entire point. Like I right. only have so much time on this earth. I right, can't exactly. read everything and have to justify my dislike for a book. You know, yeah. <laughs> like so if we fine. spread a myth about the book on this episode, then okay. Uh, you got beef with us. 
But if we say true things about the episode, you decide not to read the book or any other book. Uh, Don't let anybody guilt you. You haven't even read it. Like, well, I can cite facts about it and I know it'd be a waste of my time. So anyway, okay. Yeah. So what was the Shack book really about? Okay. All right. So I'm actually off the top of my head right now. Uh, The Shack book is, uh, it starts off as kind of a a crime thriller type thing. uh, And then it kind of turns into another type of story entirely. It really starts out uh, introducing us to a guy named Mac. Actually, I think it's a, a guy telling us about a guy named Mac. So it's doing that pseudo literary thing. Mac is kind of disillusioned with church, kind of indifferent toward church. Uh, basically, Mac is a upper white middle class guy, I think Pacific Northwest, who takes his family on a vacation. And his little daughter is abducted and taken to the shack, titular the shack, where terrible, unseemly things are done to her that aren't really described a whole lot. But the police go looking for uh, the murderer, the rapist, uh, the, the abuser. Uh, and I think they they never find him. So Mac and his family are devastated and Mac is questioning God until Mac gets an invitation in his mailbox to come to the shack to meet God. So Mac does so. Uh, he arrives at the shack, which kind of transforms into the, uh, the, the prettier version I mentioned earlier. And inside the shack, this is where the story kind of changes, uh, he encounters God the Father in the form of a, of a woman. So big subversion here. Uh, What are we doing with that? Uh, God the Son, who's kind of the more traditional uh, presentation of Jesus Christ. uh, So he's frankly my favorite in the shack because he acts most and looks most like Jesus himself. Uh, And then God the Holy Spirit, uh, who is another woman, uh, who's sort of a kind of a more airy-fairy kind of um, uh, character. So the the author is either doing something really clever with these characterizations of the person of the Trinity. And of course, all of them kind of incarnate as human beings, uh, or he's doing something very blasphemous or maybe a combination. Ultimately, the book turns into a lot of discussions back and forth, uh, just a lot of uh, character discussions where uh, these Trinity stand-ins are trying to help Mac understand why a good god would allow suffering god's nature is dealt with a lot uh what god knows uh what god's goals are uh, are dealt with a lot the book therefore does count as fantastical but it's really didactic now, that means it's basically preaching at you uh because it turns into dialogue there's just not a whole lot of plot going on it's mac in the shack talking to people and it's an interactive sermon with these imagined conversations with the Trinity. By the way, uh, this is where it gets into uh, the, the question of authors. The book is written by, at least the, the named author in the front, is, is William P. Young. Uh, he's a credited author. But then, believe it or not, when they were wanting to make a movie of The Shack, there was a whole lawsuit because it turns out that Young had a lot of editorial help from two other chaps, Wayne Jacobson and Brad Cummings, who were apparently editing so much or beta reading or whatever you call it, author people, uh, that they technically or arguably counted as co-authors. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is kind of the big thing that I didn't see a lot of people getting into because maybe it's kind of inside publishing baseball, but it counts when you are saying, well, the shack says this or the shack author believes so and so. Uh, Here's what I wrote uh, in this older article. Young continues to identify as the sole author of The Shack. The book's actual authorship is a bit more complicated. There was even a lawsuit about it. In the end, author and publisher Wayne Jacobson also speaks as the book's author with Brad Cummings, stating flatly, Paul isn't the only author of this story. So the book was written and edited by committee and only later picked up for larger distribution by Hachette Book Group. This joint authorship, like some written by committee blockbuster movies, may help explain some of the clashing tones and ideas within the story. It helps explain why the shack sounds so biblical at one moment, but then the shack offers clashing notions such as that, although God always gets what he wants, he either does want to allow evil and suffering for good reasons and or is helpless when an evildoer abducts and kills a child. We'll go over this later in the episode. Moreover, if one author, Jacobson, says he does reject universalism, but another author, Young, very clearly accepts it, that puts a crucial religious divide at the heart of the story. Unlike the unified God, the authors wish to explore, this trinity of human authors is not very well unified. Thus, the book's narrative voices become unreliable and self-conflicting. 
End quote. So, Zach, that explains, if anybody remembers, mm. a lot of the arguments over the shack. You can read the shack and just sort of tune out maybe the bits that imply that God's going to save everybody, even the rapist, even if the rapist never repents. You can tune those parts out and kind of hear what you need to hear or want to hear. Uh, or if you're a heresy hunter, you can focus only on the bits where God is portrayed as a jolly and frankly racist, stereotypical black woman. Uh, God the Father, that is. You can focus on that and you say, well, this guy thinks God is a girl and that's absurd. This is, you know, mainline liberal stuff. Uh, and focus only on the bad stuff and ignore some of the arguable orthodoxy that is in the book, uh, which we'll get into in the next chapter. So one of the things I want to ask you about the book, and this, I guess, qualifies as a spoiler, but it's been enough time to, I, I think we can spoil it. Is justice ever served in the end? to the human villain in the story. No. Okay. So see that, I think that's what my friend Aaron was latching onto, which was that this didn't have the typical happy ending to a story that it sort of leaves you wondering what's going to happen. And, you know, I can see that theme resonating with a lot of people. There's entire Psalms written about this, right? Like I think of Psalm 77, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refuse to be comforted. I think of God. I groan. I meditate. My spirit becomes weak. You have kept me from closing my eyes. I'm troubled and cannot speak. You know, the psalm goes on and there, there's a little bit more to it than just the complaint of David here. Oh, I'm sorry, of Asaph, not David. But there are many psalms like this where there is just a complaint about injustice that does not ever seem to get resolved. And, you know, weirdly, I, I think that can be comforting to people to hear another story like that, because it's like, uh, hey, someone else knows how I feel. Like, I have something in my life that has never been resolved, some ongoing problem, some ongoing brokenness, some ongoing hurt. You know, I, I can think of someone, Steve, and I, I met a couple of years ago uh, whose sister had disappeared suddenly uh, at, as an adult. And for years and years, there was no resolution to that. You know, those are really troubling kind of things. Uh, just the, especially when a crime is involved, right? Because you, you want some kind of justice to be doled out. So when it can't be, that's extremely frustrating and it just lingers. So, you know, finding some kind of purpose in all of that is often what, we're left with. That's the only hope. So, you know, going back to Keller's review of there's that the shack deconstructs the transcendence of God. See, I, I would think that's what the story would be about is that even in the midst of suffering that goes unresolved, even the midst of evil and injustice that's never answered, there's still a transcendent God. So are you saying that there still really isn't a transcendent answer to, to Max central problem? If we speak of the book as written by one authorial voice, I believe that the book thinks it has upheld the transcendence of God. If I were one or more of the book's authors and I read Keller's critique there, I may have thought, wait a minute, we, we are actually upholding the transcendence of God. Like we're, we're saying that God doesn't explain it all. Like there's even some good parts in the shack we'll get to in a moment where uh, it's argued that God does have the right not to tell everybody what's going on. The problem is, is that by the end, well, let's say this. Let's say that the book had started out with this guy going to the shack just to speak with God uh, about the terrible things that he's had happened. The fact that the shack began, however, with the uh, abduction and rape and murder of a child and then tries to fake a happy ending, the great sadness has gone away, it says at the end. Uh, the conversations with the shack don't just give Mac some solace that even if he doesn't understand why God would allow this, he knows his God is faithful and sovereign mm. and will avenge the wrong and explain the reasons someday. The shack doesn't do this. Uh, the shack okay. doesn't uh, provide uh, treatment for Max, a very deep emotional wound. By the end, the emotional wound, the great sadness, capital letters and all is gone. He oh, just kind never of magically feel that way swept again. away. Oh, yeah. Okay. So oh. see, this is why I do not believe that the book realistically mm. handles this. Anyone who's gone through that level of tragedy for real would never have that sadness go away until death and the resurrection. Yeah. You've got to have an eschatology here. 
you've got to postpone some answers until after Christ returns, after death and heaven and, and new life on the new heavens and new earth. Uh, the shack doesn't refer to this. It's all very this earth focused. And as a result, it gives a saccharine answer at the end. Um, I'm crossing over into my chapter three about what it gets wrong. I'd really like to talk about what it gets right on the way. But really, that ending does make the entire mm. book fail. Uh, almost like a certain speedy superhero movie right now that's failing at the box office. A lot of people like the start of it. A lot of people like certain elements and certain scenes. But apparently, it just deconstructs so much at the end that it all falls apart. And it leaves a bad taste in your mouth on the way out. And you're certainly not going to tell your friends to go see it. But in this case, I think a lot of people felt that that beginning and the concept and some of the truths in the discussion, uh, they struck these people as new and refreshing and maybe even biblical. And so that's why the shack sold. What was it? Keller said there are 7 million copies. And even then Keller was catching up to it about a decade later. Yeah. So that makes me wonder readers who were victims of crimes or family members of crime victims similar to the story in the shack i wonder what they thought of this uh you know I, i'm genuinely curious how that the resolution of the story you know how that came across to them did that give them some solace or peace or did they say exactly what you said like well no like that's the, the grief i have yes it's superseded by christ but the grief has not gone away and it's not going to go away till Christ wipes away every tear when we see him again. So, you know, okay, so just going back a minute to the format of the story, it's basically a long conversation, and it's almost like more of a sermon from the, the God character and this the, the, the female form. That's the whole other thing. This but, isn't even his final form. <laughs> okay, so the, one of the articles I clicked, it, it sold 7 million copies Uh the one about the lawsuits. So that was just a couple of years after his release, Se- 7 million copies turned into a movie. It sounds like it's told from like this omniscient point of view, which is kind of archaic. Oh yeah. You'll get some style examples later. Yeah. And it's definitely archaic. I would say at some points, amateurish, even for an omniscient point of view. Yeah. So maybe this is chapter two, but I'm just so curious. Why did a book like that sell so many copies? Well, there's an interesting answer about that, and it was a very early version of a podcast back when you had to huh. download the MP3 and put it on your iPod. So our DNA is actually connected with the Shack's DNA because the Shack was actually originally popularized by a podcast. Interesting. And it was some, you know, some early Theo bros uh, getting together, uh, talking about Christianity, talking about Bible stuff. Uh, maybe talking about issues they had with the church because remember Zach, there was this whole emergent church idea. Oh, so that's uh, who in, in was the late two thousands. Yeah. Well, see, the emergent church was a label applied to a kind of a loose collective of people who were upset by what they felt was mainstream evangelicalism in America. So they wanted to do a new kind of church, and uh, there was a lot of well-meaning folks uh, mixed up in that. But then the loudest voices, uh, the biggest platforms, went. Uh, to the folks who wanted to deconstruct not just cultural traditions, but biblical foundations. Mm. Donald uh, Miller was one of those guys, the blue like jazz guy. Um, Rob Bell, remember Farewell Rob Bell? He was one of those too. Both Brian of those McLaren. guys. Were, Brian McLaren was one of those. Yeah. yeah. Some of these endorsements actually, or these types of endorsements uh, are on my copy of The Shack. I was Facebook friends for a while uh, with a guy who endorsed The Shack. It took me a while to, uh, to, to match the name up not sure how we got to be Facebook friends. I will say we're not Facebook friends now, and you'll just have to guess who it is. It's not Michael W. Smith. I don't know why Michael W. Smith endorses stuff. Whenever he endorses stuff, people just get upset. Uh, did he endorse, endorse that translation that went all wrong? And then I think recently I saw uh, that uh, that he'd withdrawn the endorsement because it was a bad translation. Oh, the passion translation? I think so, yeah. But Man, that's beside the point. That's a whole uh, other episode. This other guy yeah. and I are, are not Facebook friends anymore. I think I last saw him defending polygamy. So. Uh, slippery slope is real well, in a lot of ways. It wasn't the Shack's fault. I don't think the Shack guys, not even the universalist one, would defend polygamy. Yeah, but it, it's uh, but sort once of you that. Get started, once you start unraveling things, you know, right. it's, it's a universal acid. That yes, just exactly. The solvent everything. burns through all the test tubes uh, that you uh, try feebly to contain it. Uh, and I yeah. think the solvent ultimately ends up eroding the Shack, uh, but maybe there's still some pieces left that we could enjoy. And I, I can get to those in just a moment. Well, just one other qu- thought I had here. I mean, you've got to answer this, but it sounds like it's not even really a story. It's a pseudo story and it's a sermon kind of wrapped in the, you know, format of a story. And, and Keller actually points out to this that 
you know, the, the narrative format makes it approachable, but what it really wants to do is kind of preach at you. And I mean, I guess this isn't totally a new thing for Christian fiction, right? A lot of Christian fiction takes this kind of form that it's really just a sermon in the uh, skin of a story. So, you know, that, that is sort of the, uh, the status quo for a lot of Christian books that have come out of the years. I, I think that's really changed in the last five, 10 years, but that's kind of what people had come to expect, I guess, for a while. So maybe that's not entirely surprising. I, I mean, I'm saying this 15 years later, right? Like why in the world was that kind of a book so popular? Um, I think there was another sort of, I think there was another book in the similar style around that time called the harbinger. It was basically this long conversation between two people about why did God allow nine 11? And again, it's, it's mostly just sermonizing and dialogue and not a lot of action. It's just talking head kind of thing. And yeah, it, it's, I, I think it makes me kind of sad, Stephen, cause I'm like, stories can be so much more than this. Uh, and especially when you've got a, you've got a big setup, like why would God allow this evil thing to happen? without any sort of human justice doled out and not really an answer to that. That's, I would feel really cheated as a, as a reader, just from the, you know, just from the story, forget about the theology. Um, that sounds like a really big question that it asks that it doesn't really answer. Uh, but I guess some people did get answers from it because it sold so many copies. So people are telling their friends. So did they ever make the movie? And do you know anything about the status of that or the popularity yes. of that? Yes, they made the movie. And the fact that you don't even know it was made uh, shows <laughs> just what kind of impact it had. And the movie came out in 2017. Um, actually, our previous guest, uh, Kevin McCreary of the Say Goodnight Kevin uh, YouTube channel, used to do a lot of roasting of Christian movies. Uh, it, it came in for a roasting. It was fairly well made. Uh, Zach, the movie actually starred uh, the guy who plays, um, what's his name? The human in Avatar. So that was him. The guy from Avatar, Cameron's Avatar, 2009, Sam Worthington. Oh, wow. Him. Yes, Sam okay. Worthington was in it. Yes. And uh, Octavia Spencer, she was playing God the Father. See? Subversion. Mm, okay. God might be a girl. God might be a girl. Yeah. We'll blow up your categories. We need to respect God's pronouns, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, not so much that. Just we're going to blow up your categories, man. That, that's really um, what, what the shag was about. got to understand, um, even before the movie, which came out you know, nearly 10 years after the book. Um, and I, I should link... Uh, <laughs> I should link Kevin's, uh, Kevin's uh, discussion about it in the show notes. Um, the book itself came out in a context when a lot of Theo Bros, um, folks who were annoyed by certain cultural traditions in the United States, uh, were going to town talking, actually challenging, Zach, your assumption that we ought to seek answers. They were doing a little bit of the postmodern thing. Well, it's really all about narrative and not so much didactic teaching. Why do we feel like we have to have all the answers? Uh, really, it's about the conversation and the relationships that we form with God and with people during the conversation. Uh, and most of this I get from you know, reading some of those original materials back then and then reading a lot of the responses from more grounded Theo bros in the nonfiction context. And they're saying, no, Scripture does presuppose answers, and the, answers, the answer is Christ. Yeah. The answer is the gospel. The you know doctrine is not bad, and in fact, if you're teaching that doctrine is bad, first you misunderstand the word, and secondly, you're just promoting another doctrine. So it just becomes really circular and really annoying. Yeah, I mean, if this is from 2017, uh, thebabylonbee.com. Rob Bell clarifies new book title: What is the Bible? Was the actual question. <laughs> He clarified that this is a legitimate question he was asking, not a rhetorical one, and that title should not have been given to suggest that his book contains any definitive answers to that question posed by its name. <laughs> like, seriously, what is it? I have no idea. Can someone help me out here? <laughs> Obviously, a satirical article, but it gets pretty close to the truth that, yeah, there is sort of this obsession in that in those circles of like, you could never find the answers. And okay, now, again, this resonates with people because it's partly true. I, there are a lot of things I have never gotten answered. And I don't just mean the esoteric, you know, do aliens exist kind of questions, but the, why did this happen in my life? Why did such and such thing occur? Why did God allow this kind of suffering to happen? Yeah. There's not a lot of answers to those things, but the problem is then the, 
they start to intentionally blur the lines of like, well, we can't find answers to these things, so we can't find answers to anything. And that, that's a very dangerous thing because God has spoken very clearly about a number of things. And so we have to go as far as the Bible goes and obviously no further, at least in terms of what we hold to as a conviction, but we have to go as far as the Bible goes. Exactly. And scripture is the guide. And we'll see in chapter three here uh, that the Shack's author, at least the primary author, seems to take a very dim view of written revelation. Uh, this did fit into those original conversations where people would say at the end, oh man, the Shack was so good. And then the critics would say, why? It, it didn't have any answers or it didn't have any biblical answers. And then the fan of the Shack uh, who was involved with these emergent type conversations, these postmodern stuff, uh, might say something like, well, why does it have to be about the answers? Why can't it just be about the conversation? Why are you so eager to find just the answers? Interestingly, yeah, though, the shack did try to offer its answers. Right. It's a bluff. It's a bluff that it could not pull off. It did try answers, uh, and the answers were shallow and unsatisfying. And it really goes to, I think, Zach, that the questions that we ask in the pop culture parent, which isn't so much, you know, read a book, watch a movie find all the bad stuff, write them down, you know, how many cuss words, you know, how many people got stabbed, uh, and then show all the good stuff, like people being nice to one another and loving their kids. It's more about idols. What are the idols of the story? You know, the story does get some things right, but then where are the idols uh, that are twisting around the good things into a bad thing and focusing on yourself uh, rather than your place in God's story with him as the author? And then how does Christ answer the longings that the story raises but cannot answer? I think that was really why the shag was so popular, is it hit at the right place at the right time, raised a lot of longings that people had, not only for a better religious tradition that wasn't so messed up by all the, uh, all the evangelical trappings, you know, that meant we had to deconstruct things, uh, but what do we long for? Do we long for God? Do we long for answers? Do we long for love and community? Uh, the shack was exploring those and, and offered some good answers, uh, but ultimately by the end offered some very bad answers that I think ultimately overthrew some of the good stuff we found on the way. But we did find some good stuff on the way. Let's, though, go to the second sponsor, the Author Conservatory. Maybe you, like William P. Young, have a story in mind that you would love to publish independently, hopefully with some better ideas about God and a better emphasis on craft. And maybe you even write this story all by yourself, but you too need a team. Are you a Christian student who loves writing but thinks it could never go anywhere because you've been told that writers can't make any money? Well, you've been told wrong. The Author Conservatory provides an alternative to the starving artist by training students to become entrepreneurs and writers at the same time. This three-year college alternative program offers personal coaching from industry professionals like Kara Swanson, Steve Lobby, S.D. Grimm, and Katie Phillips, along with mentorship from successful entrepreneurs so you can own your writing craft and create a realistic business plan. To learn more and apply for a free consultation, simply visit authorconservatory.com. Zach, I gotta say, not to extend the ad, I'll give them a little free press. I met a bunch of the Author Conservatory folks just last week at the Right to Publish conference at Wheaton College in Illinois. Uh, it was Kara Swanson, as well as Brett Harris, who actually helped start the Author Conservatory. Uh, Steve Lobby was also there. Uh, they're doing good work. Uh, they have their whole little crew along there doing classes on their own. And they also taught a great workshop about how to assess where you are if you're trying to write stories. So I can, uh, I can definitely recommend those folks. Well, let's go to chapter two. Which biblical truths did the shack reflect? So, yeah, what, what did it get right? that resonated with people for good reasons. Yes. Now, understanding what did it get right, I'm comparing the shack, what the shack says about God's nature and the gospel uh, with scripture. That's the standard. So here's the top 10 things that I could tell, at least a few years ago when I read the shack, the top 10 things that the shack got right. Jesus chose to die and saved us from our sickness. That's right. That's number one. Number two. God isn't some old white bearded man in the sky. Um, really basic truth there. He's not. Apparently, some people still think that that's what Christians teach. Maybe they had an over, uh, overactive imagination in Sunday school, but the Sunday school teacher never said that. I don't know. The idea gets around. The shack debunks it. The shack was correct. Three, 
quote, the truth shall set you free and the truth has a name. He's over in the wood shop right now covered in sawdust, end quote. That's the Shack's authors getting something that even some really solid Christians get wrong. Uh, they get it right that John 8, 32, uh, the truth shall set you free is not a reference to knowledge, but a reference to Jesus himself. Good job, Shack authors. Number four, God isn't like us and he is not simply the best version of man. Good job. Number five, our triune God exists as love because he is in three persons and those persons are in relationship. Now that's some complicated Trinitarian mechanics here. Good job, Shack authors. Uh, let's see, I'm counting these right. Yeah, number six, God is not evil and he has good reasons to allow evil and suffering. That basic idea is there. That is what Christians have throughout church history based on scripture have always taught. So excellent. Number seven, Jesus promises to renew the universe. Heaven will come to new earth. Yep. Number eight, our desire for independence from God is the root of all evil. We really have no absolute right as human beings. We don't even have the small right to speak uninterrupted by God. That's actually played out in the shack. I liked that moment. It's a good moment. Number nine, despite all of the shack's protests against power, what they call power, as if power is always bad, it does show a God who rightly exercises power over his created beings. So Zach, this is where you get good teaching, but bad fiction. What you see doesn't match what you're being told. What you see is that God, even though he's kind of messed up in this portrayal with the three persons and all that, two women and, and then a man acting like Jesus, what you see, though, doesn't match the idea that you're being told, like power is bad. Humans use power, you know, power. It's, it's basically, I, I hate to psycho, psychoanalyze, but a lot of folks then as now have this idea yeah, that power is bad because they've only or mostly seen power being abused. So they assume the gift of power that God gives to people is always bad. Rather common procedure often leads to legalism. But here, what the shack shows is better than what it preaches. And number 10, God's free will overrides man's free will. God has the right to remain silent while humans suffer despite having foreknowledge of events. And God even has the right to exercise power by withholding revelation. So God in this book is constantly telling Mac, you know, there's reasons I've allowed this, but I can't tell you about that. And the conversations circle that idea a lot from what I remember. Um, it seems like a cop out to a lot of people, but it was correct for the shack to say this. Like sometimes. God says, my plans are not your plans and my ways are above your ways. It's almost a repeat of the book of Job there. But really, if you want a, uh, a better, more biblical book about uh, God's response to a righteous man who suffers, I, I would recommend the book of Job. Yeah, the Although book of his, Job is pretty good. Book of Job, yeah, it's decent. It's okay. You know, three out of five stars would definitely Job again, <laughs> even though all his shacks got knocked down by whirlwinds and marauders and such like. Okay, so right away, I'm very fascinated by the fact that it wants to portray God as a Trinity or does portray God in the three person Trinity that is God. Yeah. And you know, that is a very rare thing for a story to do. Most stories are kind of Unitarian in how they portray God. I mean, in, in Narnia, you've got, okay, Aslan saying that talking about the emperor, you know, the emperor yeah, is the, the son sea. of the emperor beyond the yeah. sea. Yes. Right. I, so there I is that is unique. Mm hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know if the deep magic is supposed to represent the Holy Spirit, but eh, kind of. Well, remember, it's not an exact allegory. Yeah, so exactly. there's no Bible parallel. There's no church right. analog in Narnia. And I'd say that the shack is meant to be more literal than that. I, I think I forgot to say, but by the end, they kind of pull the, well, was it all the dream that he had while he was in a coma during a oh, car no. accident type thing? Yeah. So it's a bit of a cop out, you know. Uh, kind Yikes. of that Bunyan thing where it's one guy telling another guy about a guy falling into a dream. And then the guy in a dream dreams the dream of a man with a burden on his back. And now mm. you got two layers deep for the allegory that really are unnecessary. Just start mm. off with the guy with the burden on his back. Inception. I don't why people feel like they have to do this. Yeah, this inception, uh, you know, multi-levels deep uh, framing conceit. I think it feels literary, but isn't always uh, adding literary value. Yeah, and the second thing that stood out is the idea of you know, the root of sin being independence from God. I mean, this is how I've often explained it to people that when you look at the sin of taking the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, well, what is the problem? The problem is that God said, don't take that. Well, why not? Because then what you have is people defining for themselves what is right and wrong. And you get as many different definitions of that as there are people and no longer a 
universal objective standard, which is God's standard. And that's how we get all of the strife and conflict and war because everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And so I, I think that's great. If that's how, if that's truly how it's um, defining sin, uh, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I want to go back in chapter three and talk about this idea of sin as sickness, uh, but we can, we can pause on that for a minute. And then lastly, uh, this part about free will. Okay. So again, I, I don't know if I agree theologically with everything I'm hearing here, but I do like that this book is tackling a very heavy topic like free will and predestination and fate and whatever. Uh, that's a bold choice. I mean, just this whole idea of a story, okay, it is kind of a bold choice because it's this long conversation with God. Okay, that's it's like everything you put in God's mouth in a fictional setting. I mean, that's like a big risk you're taking, right? Each each and every one. So I I do like the boldness of this. This uh, reminds me a little bit of the movie, the Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey, where you know Bruce is uh, kind of challenging. Well, well, God, why do you allow this stuff to happen? And God's like, okay, how about you be God for a day or a week and see how you do? And uh, he ends up not being very good at it. <laughs> and so again, it's sort of that resonant uh, theme with the Book of Job of like we just don't have it within us to judge God. So why even try that? That last point though, about God saying, I can't tell you why I have these plans. I can't. Or it won't. I wouldn't say can't. Okay. Okay. No. And, right. and again, these are paraphrases. I've worked some quotes in okay. here. We'll probably have the full, full version of the show notes. There are direct quotes. I even have page numbers, folks. Like I, <laughs> pa- pa- past me and did a lot of homework, homework here. Yeah. I would not say that the God of the shack says he can't do anything. Okay. The God pictures here are definitively in charge and they have their reasons uh, so that there i think is at least a nod toward orthodoxy maybe more than a polite nod and like you said too, zach the the trinity framework here i, I agree this is unique and yeah. frankly i think that they botch it up but it's worth a shot because of the unitarian view that a lot of people have absorbed about god whether it's an old man you know whether he looks like morgan freeman or you know, somebody on a throne on a cloud somewhere in a far side cartoon, this complete uh, Unitarian idea, this kind of like strict monotheism uh, is different yeah, that's from what I'm Christianity. To say, yeah. yeah. Now, you know, that's that's uh, Judaism, that's Islam. And arguably that is how God uh, revealed himself, at least on the surface in the Old Testament. But Christians historically have believed that God exists in three person, one God, three persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. I uh, got to get my wording right. You know, they exist in relationship. Uh, a lot of people talk about how uh, there does seem to me maybe some kind of hierarchy there because the son in the New Testament, Jesus is constantly talking about obeying his father, uh, setting an example there for how we should do the same. Uh, and, and yet, you know, you don't worship one person above the other. You worship one God in three persons. And so it's admirable that the shag wants to present this uh, as opposed to you know, some Christian materials that, for example, will only talk about Jesus and then kind of mention the Father or mention the Holy Spirit. And then other Christian traditions will talk so much about the Holy Spirit that they maybe forget about God, the Father who created things and is a God of order. Or they'll only talk about uh, the Father uh, and maybe tone down the whole Jesus talk uh, so that we can uh, do crossover ministry with other monotheistic religions you know let's just talk about god and really most mm. people believe in god but you know aren't sure about jesus and the holy spirit so let's be as ecumenical as possible uh the shack puts its flag down in no we're gonna speak to and within the evangelical christian tradition which has always been about the trinity so i guess that's kind of a bonus 11th biblical truth that the shack got correct uh that god is a trinity father son and holy spirit so to that extent good job yeah. This aspect of God not telling us things. Uh, again, I, I think there's sort of this weird obsession that we've talked about the emergent church kind of gets with that of like, oh, there's no answers for anything. But there is a truth there that, yeah, God doesn't tell us everything. I mean, we all know this. And this is what so many of the books of the Bible deal with. And I appreciate that because I think that there is a temptation in Christian storytelling to just wrap everything up in this neat little bow of a happy ending. 
and everything gets resolved. And that really isn't true to life. Like that's actually not good theology to have everything possible get resolved at the end, because we know everything will not get resolved until Jesus returns. So yeah, some lingering questions, some lingering pain, uh, some even some lingering doubts. That's fine. I, I don't have a. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, and there is a lot of mystery until we see him. I mean, this is what the Apostle Paul talks about. That now we see in a mirror, darkly. So we, we don't see the full truth of everything. Well, while you're quoting scripture, Zach, we can't go forward without referencing God's word in Isaiah fifty-five eight through nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when Mr. Spock tries the Vulcan mind meld and says, my thoughts to your thoughts, God is saying, no, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You can hardly understand. You're not going to meld with me. You cannot share omniscience. Uh, I'm keeping some things to myself. Uh, other scripture refers to the secret things that are belonging to God, but the things he has revealed belong to us and our children forever. So just in case you maybe overdo it with the whole, well, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways and we can never understand. And it's, oh, what a mystery. And we just need to embrace the mystery. No, God also says the things revealed belong to you. God has told us some things about his nature. He has told us many promises about how he's going to reconcile things, including evildoers who seem to get away with it. God has promised that he is an avenging God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So if Mac were real and his daughter had been abducted and all those terrible things happened, Mac can rest in the promise of God. Not that he should embrace the mystery uh, and just do something like forgiving the attacker. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, God forbid, by the way, what an offensive teaching. Matt can instead rest that either Christ will save the attacker because Christ has himself taken the penalty at the cross for the attacker who may repent and receive Jesus and then forgiveness. Matt can rest in that or Mac can rest, I believe this, in the thought that if the attacker does not repent, that evildoer who abused an innocent child will burn in hell forever. Uh, at God's hand, the righteous judge will avenge himself upon those who attack his own image bearers. Uh, that's biblical orthodoxy. Uh, the shack would be very nervous about the doctrine of hell. It's nowhere near the book. I don't remember it being deconstructed in the book. It's just kind of bypassed, but we'll get to that next. Yeah. And it's interesting because I've read about this a little bit that it, are the authors, are they universalists or annihilationists? Oh, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll get to, to that. See, okay. again, again, it's not a single author. So okay. <laughs> it's a messy trinity here. You yeah. know, you've got one author saying one thing and another author mm. saying another thing. So is the Shack universalist or is it orthodox? The answer is, well, yes, <laughs> in some respect. Yeah. So the Shack is not on our summer reading challenge list for the Lord Haven summer reading challenge, but some really great books are. We have that exciting announcement we made earlier this month, the Lord Haven summer reading challenge that began on June the 8th. If you love a Christian made fantastical fiction and you want something different than what the library might offer this summer, this challenge is for you. We want this to bring friends and families together over a shared love of old classics and new favorites. Whether you are a busy young professional looking for beach reads or a student needing summer break reading material or a harried homeschooling mom trying to keep the kids' shelves stocked, Laura Haven has found a story to inspire you and we can't wait to have you join us. How do you do that? Look at the link in our show notes for the announcement as well as our massive review list. Uh, Laura McCary got this together. Uh, she our, she's our marketing manager and she put together all the reviews that we've made sorted them by age and genre so you can get a fantastic book and of course sign up free at lorehaven.com join then the lorehaven guild on discord and share these stories with other heroes okay steven let's go to our final chapter here how did the shack deconstruct biblical doctor we've talked about deconstructionism before on this podcast a hot topic it's deconstruction so hot right now so how did this book deconstruct objective biblical truth? How do we need to respond with God's word? 
Yeah, get out your popcorn, crack your knuckles. This is where it gets good. Uh, Lori even doesn't do negative reviews, but here I do. Uh, <laughs> and it's not so much, well, except for the last, you know, I, I'm not so much saying, well, the book is bad fiction and it's got some corny dialogue. Uh, it's got some offensive dialogue, frankly. I'll get to that in a moment. Because the shack is so didactic, it is perfectly fair to treat it as if you just heard a bad sermon or a well-delivered sermon, if you must say this, with some very bad content. Um, even a bad sermon, though, may at least uh, be based on the Word of God. And I must say here, Zach, out of the gate, uh, the Shack's author or authors don't seem to appreciate the written Word of God very much. Mm. Uh, and frankly, I've referred to the church back home syndrome before. I don't know these guys. I wasn't in church with them. I don't know their story. It just seems to me an early example of church back home syndrome, where you take your negative church experience or your negative experience with a Christian school or a family or an institution that employed you, and you project that all over everything. And it's gross and it's foolish and it's frankly narrow minded. Uh, you don't know that there are good Christian groups and families and churches out there. You just can't help but see the bad ones. Here's a quote from the shack in seminary. Mac had been taught that God had completely stopped any overt communication with moderns referring to have them only listen to and follow sacred scripture properly interpreted, of course. God's voice had been reduced to paper, and even that paper had to be moderated and deciphered by the proper authorities and intellects. Nobody wanted God in a box, just in a book, especially an expensive one bound in leather with gilt edges. Or was that gilt edges? So that's a quote from the shack. Very clever pun there at the end. Uh, gilt spelled two different ways. Uh, editorializing, by the way, this is bad fiction. Uh, this is just within the first uh, chapter or so where the author, omniscient point of view, is editorializing. We are hovering over Mac. We're not getting his view on things. We're getting the author's commentary and, frankly, biased opinion based on seeming his own seminary uh, education. So Mac is kind of a placeholder. He's kind of a self-insert in some ways, uh, arguably here. Uh, and then this is the author taking pot shots at the professors and the implications he's gotten from the evangelical church. Uh, that the only way you get to meet God or have a relationship with him is through the dry, old, boring, dusty Bible. Oh, boo. Yeah, what does what the Bible know? It's just been around for thousands of years, and it's uncancelable. Yeah, so, boy, so much to go and do there. This opinion is never corrected, by the way. Yeah, this is the, this is a standing judgment to get the Bible out of the way. We're going to shelve the Bible and go off to the shack to get some answers from God yeah. uh, in, in a more intimate way. Well, and as much as we kind of joke about this, I mean, th this really is the foundational error that every cult makes, that you can't trust the Bible, you need to trust this new revelation. And that has been going on since the very beginning when Satan said to Adam and Eve, did God really say that? I don't know if that's true. And that's what people are always being tempted to believe, that God's word is not trustworthy and we need some kind of new word to live by. So I, I want to talk about maybe one of the more subtle ways this shows up, and that is the choice of the word sickness instead of sin. So right away, okay, this, again, this is me that has not read the book. But right away, what I think is happening in this book is that sin is not being portrayed as a moral rebellion against the supreme law giver of the universe, that it's, it's not this guilt-innocence paradigm. Now, just side note for a second, there are different ways that sin manifests through shame and fear, and it causes different things, I should say, uh, but sin is ultimately rebellion against a holy God. And it causes guilt, it causes shame, it causes fear. But what did Adam and Eve do? They disobeyed God. And, and that is the foundation of sin, is, is going your own way, as it says in Isaiah 53. We, we all, like sheep, have gone astray, each one to our own way. So, is that how sin is portrayed in the shack? Or, or what is this whole thing about sickness? I think that sickness would be a very fair understanding of how the shack understands sin. I believe the word is used, uh, just drawing from memory here, uh, certainly the the idea of you know, assaulting a child and brutally murdering her is wrong. We would call that sin. We would call that evil. I believe the word evil is used. 
Uh, the story is not trying to say, despite some of the universal like, uh, impulses of one of the authors, it's not trying to say that this is all good and it'll all shake out in the end. Uh, but because the story is so bothered, uh, not publicly, uh, but with ideas about a firm revelation of God in Scripture, uh, and even more distant is the idea of God's vengeance being visited upon sinners uh, in a place of eternal torment called hell, uh, and not even a temporary hell. You know, the idea of annihilation isn't here uh, specifically no. any more than universalism. Uh, but the implications are there. Like you almost get the idea that maybe one guy wanted to put it in and the other guy said no. And one, like it really is, it kind of opens up interpretation when you realize, okay, there's three different authors here, you know, each with their own theological traditions and maybe one Jacobson being more biblically orthodox than the other young. Uh, don't know about the other guy, the third guy. Maybe he's the Holy Spirit and we just ignore him in this analogy. <laughs> the Trinity of authors. Just like cessationists. Yeah. Well, it's a Trinity of authors that can't agree on stuff. And so that's why you get this, this self-contradiction. So yes, it's bad that the guy kidnaps and tortures the child. It's not good for Mac to suppress his emotions. You know, there's a moral binary here. But because we've already dismissed the Bible here as the, as the arbiter of what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is false. Uh, and yet we kind of still keep the tropes from the Bible, the very idea of God as Trinity and the idea of God, you know, revealing stuff and not revealing other stuff. Like we want to kind of dismiss the Bible as a tool of the oppressors and yet also mm. keep elements of the Bible. Uh, at that like. point, you're just disconnected from the supply and you are breathing stale oxygen. Uh, and it's eventually going to run out. Very yeah. bad pun there. Very bad reference, given what just happened. That's the first one that came to mind. I'm honing in on this word sickness, though, just because sickness is something that's passive, right? Like you catch right. you a catch cold. sick, yeah, rather than choosing, right. like licking a doorknob. <laughs> that's more like what human beings do. We, right. we have weak immune systems, but then we also go out and we lick all the doorknobs. Right. So it, it's sort of like you're the victim of sin rather than the perpetrator of sin. And that just seems at odds with this whole premise of there was an evil man who did evil things to an innocent child. And yet that evil was caused by a cold, a spiritual cold that he caught, that he's just as much a victim of his sin as his human victim. Uh, like, you could get that implication. Yes. See that that's a big problem because well, with the big distortion of the idea in Narnia, for example, that yeah. no one has ever told his story, but his own, you know, there's not so much, you don't know that guy, you don't know how he suffered. But there is a little, and actually come to think of it, there is a little of that. You know, there's kind of a, well, you know, the guy who abused was himself abused and you know, human beings are just getting human and that's just the way things are. It's certainly an idea that you get in the story. Yeah. Well, and you bring up Narnia. I mean, Edmund betrayed his siblings, like, and he ate the Turkish delight and he chose to go to the white witch's house. And so, you know, those were all choices he made that demanded payment which of course Aslan took on as the Christ figure. And that's so important because if you get the wrong definition of sin, you get the wrong definition of salvation. You know, if sin is just something passive that happens to you, you're a victim and you just can't help it. Well, then, you know, you just need to be saved by some more knowledge or understanding or revelation or wisdom or love or, you know, just things that you can kind of do yourself. Uh, you don't need this savior to actually come and step into history and pay the penalty for your sin. So, yeah. And again, it's like, even if you look at the honor shame paradigm of sin, someone has to take away that shame. Like you can't take away your own shame. Someone has to give you honor. Someone from a place of honor has to have an exchange and take on your shame and give you his honor. So, you know, that's the interesting thing here with a lot of this postmodern emergence stuff. It, it tries to get away from some of the Western conceptions of, uh, of sin and everything, but you go to the more Eastern conceptions and it's, it's really not that different in the sense, like there's still the same act happening of God taking care of our central problem that we can't take care of ourselves. You know, if sin is just a sickness, well, just take your vitamins get an immunization or go to the doctor or just, you know, work out some more. There's things you can do about it. So you don't need a savior if you're just sick. No, but you do need a good therapist. 
And in this yeah. case, when you say that, Zach, I mean, what better therapist could you get uh, but a squad of versions of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that ultimately is Max's salvation in the shack because he gets some really, really good therapy. Mm. And yet, interesting, you mentioned then how this removes uh, the choice of sin uh, from the storyline. What this does in terms of the fiction is it removes Max's agency. Mac is very passive in this book. Um, I can't picture him in my mind. I don't remember him as anything other than uh, kind of a blank canvas, kind of a vague outline of a character. I mean, he's a man with a middle-class job. I mean, I read the book six years ago, but for a famous book, those details should stick out. I don't mean you have to know his height and you know hair color necessarily, but certain details uh, should stick out. But because he's more of a self-insert, um, a placeholder for the reader, uh, he doesn't have a lot of agency on his own. He is not chosen to sin uh, in some ways. He doesn't have a problem he needs to fix. There's no hero's journey here. Uh, so the fictional structure itself is compromised, uh, as well as some of the the doctrines it's going through. I, I still want to talk about the fiction as we go, but let's talk then about this issue of, you know, why do bad things happen to people? The story does want to tackle these tough questions. Uh, even as intense as the rape of a small child. Maybe I should have put a trigger warning up front. We keep referencing that, but the shack does. On the back cover, it actually says, and maybe you can play the old movie announcer voice in your head, in a world where religion seems to grow increasingly relevant, the shack wrestles with a timeless question. Where is God in a world so filled with unspeakable pain? It doesn't even do one man must journey to the shack. <laughs> you know, that would make it a little more epic. And I can think of some other things that would have fixed it here. Like, for example, instead of this commentary about the battle Bible with its gilt edges, you know, flashback to Max time in seminary and a conversation he had. You can have a whole chapter about that playing back and forth. You can even uh, cast your old bad seminary instructor yourself as the bad guy in the story. It would be obvious, but it would at least be slightly better fiction. Uh, so from there, uh, it doesn't work. And, and then I would say from here, with all due respect, well, the shack, uh, it, uh, it does it right where religion is increasingly irrelevant. Uh, I would say it's actually the shack that's irrelevant and maybe some mm. evangelical traditions are irrelevant. Uh, but the timeless truth of God's word and the wrestlings of the Psalms and other theologians with this yeah. question are much more relevant. Here's what I wrote back then. The ill treatment begins with a writing style that hovers over characters and does not go inside. We do not truly feel Max's sadness. Verbiage adds distance, not intimacy. His emotions even have their own distinct title, like an album with italics. The Great Sadness. So breaking what I said there, this is a cheat. You're looking at this guy from outside. You're not going into his head. Uh, this actually is a distancing effect. Uh, for all the books, uh, a challenge of the idea that Mac is distant from his emotions, the story keeps us distant from his emotions. So y'all both need therapy. Uh, Mac's <laughs> denial of emotions is also bashed into our heads with sentences like, with every effort he could muster, he kept himself from falling back into this black hole of emotions. Really? So not confronting these negative emotions is bad. Or could this be a bit clearer? I was a little snarky back then. I'm kind of feeling snarky now. Thanks, past self. Perhaps worst of all, any real impact of these terrible events that Max's daughter is abducted, presumably raped, and murdered is blunted by the story's gross assurances. It's not as bad as we think. God manifested to Missy to lessen her terror and spoke to her heart, and Missy even prayed right then for her father's peace. Here and elsewhere, the shack refuses to show human evil and suffering closer to their realistic worst. Even as the authors teach us that Max's denial of emotions equal bad and weeping equal good, they deny us real reasons to weep. This is the shack at its most sticky and saccharine, and I felt offended by its entire implication. Mm. That's what I wrote then. Yeah, I, I still agree with myself. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, so a big theme I keep hearing you say, and you said it really clearly in the beginning, is the shack is trying to get God off the hook. You know, and this is ultimately where a unbiblical or insufficient understanding of sin, evil, and suffering leads us. There was a, a really popular secular book in the late 90s, early 2000s. I can't remember the name of it, but the conclusion of it was, we just need to forgive God because he's really not that in charge of the world and things just kind of happen. 
and it's not his fault. Mm-hmm. So we just need to forgive him because eh, people have free will and what's God going to do about it? Now, it's interesting, though, that you say that in the shack, God's free will overrules man's free yeah, will, Mac's which I, not asked I think to, is correct. Yeah, Mac is yeah. not asked to forgive God. They don't go that far. I think maybe but, some readers of the shack might think that. That's kind of where sh- you end up, That, right? that is where yeah. you will end up. It is the right. logical conclusion. Uh, in this case, it's not so much, you know, God uh, didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, I don't remember any open theism referenced here, you know, this idea okay. that God lacks the ability to predict these things. God is not the prime mover of this terrible situation, but we're moving in with kind of these touched by an angel scenes of, you know, you know, the, the, the death angel came to get him before he burned to death in the fire. You know, it really wasn't that bad. Like, okay, maybe God can step in and do something like that, you know, especially for a child. I, I don't know. We're not told those things. Maybe we'll find out, you know, it's not, it's not beneath God to override some things like that. But I'd rather be like Puddle Glum from the Silver Chair and prepare for the worst, uh, but put a bold face on it. Um, I'm not even that much of a cynic or a curmudgeon. I just I want to be prepared for the fact that people may actually undergo and feel these terrible things, and they are terrible things. Uh, God doesn't move in like morphine and make them less terrible. Uh, he moves in with himself. He offers himself and his presence that will always be there. He's not going to snip the nerve endings. It's so funny that, yeah, the shack, again, is blaming Mac for emotionally distancing, but it adds these other therapeutics intended to help distance from the real pain and the real suffering. Like even some truths like Romans 8, 28, well, God works everything together for good. I don't think the shack pulls that one, but if a biblical truth can be used as if it's a kind of morphine when people really just need a hug or a hot meal or some time alone. How then would a lie strike people? And I think it's just a sentimentalist lie to suppose uh, that God's going to nerf the horror of the situation. He's just going to wrap it all up in foam so you don't bruise yourself on the hard corners. Uh, Sometimes we do bruise ourselves on the hard corners and very badly. Yeah. Well, here's my other question about the book. Okay. So what I think is the ultimate answer to suffering, just really a TLDR version here, is that Jesus entered into our suffering. Amen. Incarnation you know, is the only answer you get. Yeah. Exactly. Right. We That's the only real and solid answer everyone gets. It's the same answer for everyone. Jesus entered into human suffering, and he took right. on our infirmities. He took on our pain and our sadness. Okay. So that, you know, and just think about that for a second. He didn't have to. He didn't have to incarnate. And once he did, he didn't have to suffer. I mean, the devil shows up in Matthew 4 and says, Man, why don't you turn those rocks into bread? You got the power to do it. Why are you going through all the suffering? Well, it's a great question. Why did he? Well, because he that's how he shows his love for us, okay? Is that he subjected himself to the same rules that we are subjected to as humans. So I, I think anything beyond that, you know, and any kind of answer to suffering beyond that, I don't know that it's really going to satisfy. But here's my question then about the shack. Does any of the persons of the Trinity portrayed there suffer? Hmm. Hmm. No. There's not a lot of reference to Christ's suffering that I can remember. It's very much separated from the biblical narrative. The persons of the Trinity are occasionally referencing maybe some biblical events, but I would say that gospel solutions, the suffering of Christ, not just as our example, or not only so he would know how hard it was, but because he is taking the penalty for sin that led to the suffering. He is making a way, is dealing with it, uh, not only in the past and present, but also in the future. So it, it is very much a diet gospel book, it's very much a gospel <laughs> light book. L-I-T-E, not L-I-G-H-T. Uh, as a result, uh, the book, by being agnostic about the gospel, withholds the gospel, maybe from the very readers who would need that the most. Possibly they'd heard the whole bit about Jesus dying on a cross and they feel numb to that. But in that case, you know, really, I don't mean to diss therapy, but maybe you need to get some Christian therapy for that. Why have you gone numb to the idea that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross to help you in your suffering now and to set you free from your suffering later. Uh, The Shaq's version here is an imposter. 
Uh, Mac is set free from his suffering. The shack offers a, kind of a, a, a copy of the gospel and that Mac uh, is set free through these conversations uh, with these uh, Trinity characters. And then by the end, the great, great sadness has gone away. Uh, he's just let go of his fear and shame and guilt and grief and all of that. Uh, and it would never bother him again. Um, that is just not scripture. That's, that's not you know, Lamentations. That's not Ecclesiastes. That's not Psalms. Uh, you read a psalm, as you mentioned at the beginning, Zach, uh, and it kind of ends with, well, I will just call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, it doesn't say. And then I woke up the next morning and the sun was shining and, you know, I dried off my bed covers that were stained with all my tears overnight and everything was okay. Uh, that's that's saccharine. And I, I think that it kind of belies the claim that the shack deals realistically with these issues. Mm. Uh, go through real quick. Uh, the issue that people raised a lot back then is this idea of God being portrayed by women, at least in uh, two of the Trinity persons. Um, I just stopped right there and say, don't portray anybody but Jesus as incarnate in the first place. Uh, you're just blowing up too many biblical categories there. Mm. Uh, God the Father is spirit. The Holy Spirit is so spirit. It's even in his name. You're not supposed to see God the Father and live, but you do see his face in the person of Christ, the image of the invisible God. Just don't mess with that stuff. I think the bigger issue there, though, is the stereotypical male and female virtues in the book. I'm not sure what was going on here, and I'm not egalitarian. But this book made me think egalitarian and just wonder what kind of Sunday school classes these guys were in. Uh, there's some dialogue here I may put in the show notes about uh, the world in many ways would be a much calmer and gentler place if women ruled. There would have been far fewer children sacrificed to the gods of greed and power. And then men are such idiots sometimes. Uh, the women characters are either playing God uh, or they're just distant, uh, kind of like actually some shallow and conservative evangelical movies where the women don't get any arc at all. It's the guys who are the main characters, uh, but they're not really acting like men a lot of the time. And it's the women who are sort of these um, template figures. They're the ones who pray. Uh, they're the ones who are just waiting for their husbands to get their act together. And you know, frankly, as a man, I found that kind of offensive. But right here, this book was written by all dudes. So not sure what was going on there, but the issue of you know, women are more nurturing uh, and men are just afraid of their emotions. Like that is a stereotype and that is offensive. Uh, and then, frankly, it's also offensive to women because women are not the only nurturers. You know, men can nurture. Where do we get this notion that there's uh, no, that only women can nurture? That's just that's just kind of silly stuff. Mm hmm. Um, the universalism you mentioned earlier, Zach, I guess we got to get to that. And then I'll close out with some uh, nitpicks on the writing style that are still accurate. Um, people did criticize the shack before for playing at universalism. So is the shack universalistic? Does it have the, have this idea in there uh, that all dogs go to heaven or all people eventually go to heaven? Yes, it does. I'll put my flag on that claim. One co-author of The Shack, Wayne Jacobson, has said that he is not a universalist. So, okay, I'll take his word for it. I'm not going to say he's lying. But the named cover author, William P. Young, says he is. Last time I checked. And Tim Challey's got on this uh, by reviewing a nonfiction book the guy later wrote called Lies We Believe About God. So he's still trying to tell everybody what to think. And the uh, uh, Young actually said, quote, Are you suggesting that everyone is saved, that you believe in universal salvation? That is exactly what I am saying. Here's the truth. Every person who has ever been conceived was included in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. End quote. Heresy. That is a heresy. Yeah, I, th I think Jesus would be uh, surprised by that. <laughs> yeah, quite surprised, especially in those bits at the end of the book of Revelation, where one way or another, some people are ending up in some kind of torment and their smoke goes up forever and ever. You can debate universe, you know, annihilationism and all that. The point is here. Young thinks everybody eventually gets saved one way or another. The Bible thinks otherwise. The Bible was written by the guy who died and rose again from my sins, so I'm going to believe what Jesus thinks about that. There may be good stuff in the shack, but I think ultimately it's undone by at least this one author on a trajectory toward universalism. Yeah, it sounds like overall we get a very uh, discount version of Jesus in the shack. Yeah, very, very much so. And and. You know, as much in the narrative, uh, as much as the dialogue, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the dialogue between the God characters got more attention because it does tend to be, or at least sound on the surface, a little more orthodox, mm. but the book itself frames everything and, and narrates things to an extent that you end up going in, I think, in a very unhealthy direction, especially with this uh, evaporation of the great sadness at the end. 
Um, there's at least one moment, by the way, where Papa, that is God the Father, says, there is power in what my children declare. Mm-mm, mm-mm. It sounds so a little like sus a prosperity right there. gospel there. Yeah, uh, just word a bit. of faith theology or something. Just a little mm-hmm. bit, just a little bit maybe there, or at least, you know, scraps, scraps, because this is not informed by a coherent theology. It's informed by memes uh, from the Bible and Christian culture. Um, I must say, Zach, that um, there is a, a, I know you like the Matrix, but there's a really dated Matrix reference in there. And it's just not, <laughs> oh <laughs> just my goodness, not aged very well. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Also, there's just some bad writing. I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, there's just some cornball writing. Uh, there's some of my favorite critics uh, back in the 2000s were pointing out. Uh, here's one example. Mac hit hard, back of the head first, and skidded to a heap at the base of the shimmering tree, which seemed to stand over him with a smug look mixed with disgust and not a little disappointment. Uh, as the critic uh, I read once I said... I don't understand that line. Yeah, no. as the critic as the critic once said, like, um, I'm having trouble imagining that expression for a human being, and a human being has a greater emotional range than, than trees. a tree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And not even tree beard mm. could uh, pull off that look. Uh this one here, uh, yes. Mac wanted more, and he was about to get much more than he bargained for. So that's like uh, again, it's back to that omniscient point of view. Right. Just in and of itself is uh no thanks. That that's just I don't know. It it just feels very patronizing, like that kind of uh, voice in fiction. Right. And well, it can be done well, um, but generally when you're not uh, tinged with this edge of sentimentalism, the omniscient point of view, trying to lead you in this sentimentalist, uh, happy sappy direction just doesn't work. Uh, That informs the theology as well as the style. Um, Oh, I love this line. Um, There's a, there's a tree growing Uh, and somebody literally says, yeah, it's on page. 13 no 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 footnote 13 page 236 if you want to go look at it in the shack uh it is a tree of life mac growing in the garden of your heart my mouth just curdles reading that and this see folks just so you know lore haven behind the scenes this is why i try not to do negative reviews because i get all snarky <laughs> about it but here there's no way to avoid saying this is just bad, corny dialogue. It takes me right out of the story. I feel like I'm sitting there in a fetal position watching like one of the most corniest Christian movies ever, uh, except it's in a book. And so I'm participating in the imagination and therefore I'm somehow culpable. So it ends up, I think, Zach, ultimately, all the theology aside, all the you know misbegotten doctrines of the sun, misbegotten doctrines of the Trinity, um, the universalistic streak. Uh, the sentimentalism crosses over into just making the shack a bad, strange case of Christian fiction that just wasn't done well. And yet we've read uh, Christian fiction that isn't written well, but is at least founded on a coherent worldview, maybe a very shallow biblical worldview, but at least you get the gospel there, even if they are hitting you over the head with it. I'd rather them hit you over the head if you have to be hit over the head. I'd rather it be the gospel uh, than this sort of squeaky toy <laughs> theology kind of the rubber chicken at some points uh, that the shack is hitting you over the head with all that aside i do want to say this this doesn't mean you're a bad christian for reading or liking the shack yeah no, no. i hope somebody made it this far even if they're yelling uh, into their earbuds right now if you read the shack back in the day if your grandma read the shack your aunt uh your uncle from that uh that you know just keeps church hopping for example uh and if you liked the shack you're not a bad christian all right Everybody has to start somewhere. We all grew up loving cartoons, for example, uh, that if we go back and we watch them now, we realize this animation is terrible. Uh, This was a dub and the dub was bad. Why did I ever like this? Don't feel so embarrassed. God works through even flawed stories that aren't made well. And yes, he can work through, believe it or not, although I'd say over, God can work over bad theology, even bad theology can introduce you to some good ideas eventually. Maybe mix it in with the bad theology and then the great shepherd will sort it out at the end. Uh, He's sorting the sheep from the goats as individuals and also the sheep ideas from the goat ideas uh, that need to go away and get roped off forever. But the story as fiction, just it's just good and honest to note. As fiction, the shack is a saccharine and unsatisfying homily. I was more disappointed with it as I thought I would be just as I was more impressed than I thought it would be. Uh, But worse, because it's so didactic, uh, because it's so luxury, even with the conversations, the dialogue, 
The story does ultimately do what we now call deconstruction. That's a new word. Wasn't used in the shack or back then that I remember. It does deconstruct the complexity of gospel truth. He wants to deal with these complicated emotions and grief and sorrow, but isn't qualified to deal with those things. You can't wrap that up in a neat little bow at the end of a book, no matter how much therapy you get from your fictional God characters. You've got to end a story with a hint of hope like that. Maybe more than a hint, if you've put the reader through a lot of struggle, you need to make the reward worth it, uh, at least approximate, uh, approximate that in the fiction. But ultimately, it just does not work. I felt very hollow. I felt very disappointed. I was laughing at the end. I didn't feel spiritually satisfying at all. Uh, and if you, faithful listener, are going through some suffering, uh, or maybe seen suffering in the news, a certain submarine, for example, When evil things happen to people, even people whom God has made good in Christ, that's terrible. It is okay to mourn. It's okay to grieve. We don't grieve as those who have no hope, but we don't pretend that the great sadness goes away in a magical cottage in the woods somewhere. And what really helps there is that God has promised to avenge the wrong. You can't get to the end of the sadness without some vengeance going on, even violent vengeance. The wrath of God is just as real as his love. He will either pour it out on Christ uh, backwards in time at the crucifixion, uh, or he will pour it out on the heads of those who have abused you and never repented for that. For all the wrongs done to you or in the world, our author will resolve them. And I hope someday, maybe when the Shack's uh, copyright is up, we'll get a rewrite someday. Maybe it goes into the public domain. I was actually thinking in the back of my head throughout this whole discussion, how would I improve the Shack? How would you fix that? You could even keep the Trinity figures in the shack somewhere. That could be the big, daring, bold, uh, possibly subversive move. But if they were saying better stuff, that could at least start to redeem it. So I think that there is hope for the shack yet. But just like there's hope for the great sadness we really have, uh, it's going to take a longer time to replay. So speaking of a story that could have used some improvement before release, uh, we had a news review uh, from uh, Daniel White the Fourth about the Flash movie. Uh, Daniel White the Fourth actually liked the Flash movie. I've not seen it. I will never see it. Uh, maybe I'll see some clips of favorite characters, but it ain't doing too well. It's setting records for all the wrong reasons. But Daniel liked the movie, and we do like pointing out the good in movies when we can at Lore Haven. So you'll find that in our on-screen section. Our last episode was how can Christian parents train their kids to become fantastic creators? Zach and Naomi did a terrific job with that. I always like uh, listening to a show that I had no hand in making. So major props to them. And then we also had a review of Desi and Kai Go Boof, uh, which is a young reader's book. We're always happy to get some of those around here at Lorehaven. New review coming out uh, next week and maybe some other stuff that we'll talk about will also be uh, unveiling our next book quest for the Lorehaven Guild as we wrap up our current book quest in June for Frank Peretti's uh, supernatural, timey wimey novel, romantic drama, really, novel uh, illusion. Well, over at the comm station, we've got two notes one from David, who used the feedback form on lorehaven.com about episode 166. And this was uh, my discussion with Stephen Should Christians hire non believers to help make fantastic stories? And David just wanted to point out a detail that we kind of got wrong. He said, hey, you guys, great show yet again. I just wanted to point out that the Jesus actor in the uh, visual Bible production of the Gospel of John, Henry Ian Cusick, is half Peruvian and half Scottish, end quote. Okay, well, thank you, David, for pointing that out. Uh, Yeah, so that's the 2003 movie that came out. It's uh, basically word for word from the Gospel of John. Uh, the uh, IMDb says it's the Good News Bible translation in sequential order from beginning to end. Hey, just a very great, straightforward adaptation portrayal of the Bible. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't get a discount Jesus in there. It, it's the uh, pretty accurately portrayed Jesus. But that is interesting to think of uh, the main actor, uh, his uh, ethnic background. So, yeah, he's not Middle Eastern. Uh, but he's not uh, just straight up Anglo. He, he's a, a little bit uh, different of a, a mix. But, you know, I I just think of him as Desmond from Lost. So that was the weirdest part for me of watching that movie. Although I really like it. I just think uh, he's just going to say, hey, brother, <laughs> like over and over again. 
Yeah, I, I like the Gospel of John. I've seen it maybe two or three times. I, I would definitely recommend that as one of the better biblical adaptations. I didn't mean to dismiss him as some white guy. I was probably doing a composite Jesus movie in my head, uh, going back to the 60s with uh, some of the swords and sandals stuff they were trying. When you do have this like ridiculously blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus uh, whose sandals never even touch the Palestinian earth, uh, that stereotype does linger for a reason. But it, yeah, it'd be unfair to project that all over a better movie like the Gospel of John. And for our last episode, 167, where I had my lovely wife on the show to talk about how can parents train their kids to become fantastic creators, Scott Kelly replied to Stephen's Facebook post about this episode and said, quote, and instill a respect, appreciation, and application of the arts into your local churches and Christian communities. If a Christian sees the church shy away or outright avoid artistic expressions, it's guaranteed they're going to flock elsewhere. The church should be a bastion for the arts, not a whitewashed tomb. And I say that as a member of a church that primarily has, unfortunately, so undecorated white walls. I'll be listening to this episode for sure. Love your podcast as always. I'll add that even though my church has a long way to go with this, I'm working with a handful of Christians to create and sustain an artist support group for our local area that is based in truth and beauty only understood through the lens of Christianity. We're hoping that over time, it will help influence the culture in our region, including our churches. Got to make sure your heart and hands match your mind and words after all, end quote. Well, Scott, I, I love what you're doing. I think that's so great that you've set your sights on your local church and kind of the surrounding churches and that you really want to influence your region, like that you're starting local. You know, I, I think the mistake I see uh, Christian creators, authors, musicians say is, oh, well, because of the internet, I can reach everyone in the world and change everything. It's like, now you, you pretty much change the people closest to you first uh, and maybe the most. And so I, I love that you've got that, that mindset there, Scott. And I, I hope and pray that that works out well and that, that uh, support group becomes something really substantial. And uh, yeah, hopefully the, uh, the white walls... <laughs> In your church, uh, have some cool decorations on them. By you know, Stephen, I I came from a church background where there was beautiful stained glass and organs and that kind of thing. Really beautiful churches, and and now to very simplistic, uh, minimalist type churches. And uh, for the longest time, I thought that was a lot more spiritual. And now I'm like, gosh, I just I really long for those beautiful buildings that I grew up with because. The uh, the nightclub for Jesus or the warehouse for Jesus, uh, just not doing it for me, you know. Aesthetically, I I get it. I I like that we redirect our a lot of our money to missions and helping the poor and all kinds of cool things. But can't can't we just have some some cool paintings or just a little bit of something? I I think we're we're getting there. Like we're also kind of moving in that direction of more a little bit more beautiful architecture. But yeah, I I wouldn't mind some more of that. Hey, at least the whitewashed wall is whitewashed. It could be a dingy wall. And yet even <laughs> then, I'm going to misquote the scripture where the Apostle Paul says, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. So yeah, whitewashed walls are just that the, the scripture takes a very dim view of those. So I don't think that's necessarily an argument for decorating the walls, but you get the arguments for decorating the walls from the tabernacle passages in scripture. And even going back further, just knowing that God is a God of beauty and order and artistic expression. Uh, which is truth expressed in the form of colors and music and sounds. And I, I think, Zach, a lot of this, too, if you're talking about local churches, it's an issue of budget and time as well as yeah, priority. Sure, um, People are a lot more accustomed to music and messages and fellowship events and stuff. And, of course, you got to find some place to put the kids. And sometimes it's really hard to find volunteers, even for those basic needs. Once you get the basic needs taken care of, though, please. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, make not just the walls, uh, but creative expression a priority behind that, if at all possible. But that's got to start, as you and Naomi talked about, Zach, uh, with raising kids who value art and things like math and engineering more naturally. If it's possible to do that uh, with your kids, then please, please do so if you got kids. And then we will raise uh, better readers who expect more out of stories, Christian-made fantastical stories included. Next on Fantastical Truth, speaking of which, hey, it's Independence Day, which in the state of Texas may as well be a religious holiday. Most people think Christian fiction avoids unclean content like sex, violence, and bad language. 
But in fact, many of these stories have often pushed these limits. We know of a few books now that are experimenting with these and just in time for Independence Day in the United States. In our next episode, we will ask, should these stories make very free to show their characters a cussin' and a fightin'? Meanwhile, maybe you're a fan of the shack. We hope we did not trod on your toes too much, but maybe you see the flaws in this book. Or maybe you were always a critic of this book or just dismissed it when you heard about it because you heard it was heresy. Well, you're half right, you're half wrong. Everybody's half right, half wrong about this. I think it's important, though, to understand that even though a book may fall apart with a trinity of authors that have different ideas they're bringing to the project, God himself is in a trinity, and each of those persons agree with one another. He is love, he is order, and he is truth, and he is all together where we're flying apart, even though we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth.